Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kirk Diedrich. I am the uh, Director of Quality for Argos U.S. Just to give you an idea of how, what size we are, we run from about Richmond, Virginia, down into Florida, and then across into Texas and Dallas and Houston. So we run about 210 plants, and as you can see, we've got, we have quite a few trucks out there. Now, for what I'm gonna talk about today, we actually only have Atlanta and Dallas set up on this system, but I think you're gonna see that it, it was teed up pretty nice here in this last conversation because the results that we are seeing mimic exactly what he just finished talking about. So these guys actually started in Dallas back in 2012. And we figured out that you can't do it 10 trucks at a time, that if you're gonna really do it, you've gotta do all of it at one time, or you've got some trucks that have it and some don't. Because we were kind of a, a new getting into it, we didn't really know what we were doing, and we learned the hard way. So as you can see, they did an expansion again in 15. They got up to about 50% of the fleet. There was different versions coming out, so this would have been version three at that time. It wasn't until 2016 that we've got full fleet in Dallas, which at that time was about 240 trucks, somewhere in that area. They struggled. You know, it was one of those that we weren't fully committed and like I said before, if you don't have all the trucks set up, uh, it, it just doesn't work like it should. So we, we learned a vital lesson. So when it was time to bring it out in Atlanta, we did a full truck implementation. We did about 205 trucks at that time. We also added the admixture systems on it because we want the type of work that we do in Atlanta can get pretty sophisticated and we wanted to make sure that we handled not just water addition, but that we could do the admixture addition also. So right now we are uh, up in two cities uh, getting ready to make our next move here shortly. So we don't seem to ever do anything kind of halfway so instead of just doing a simple route and picking a few things that we might go out here and track, we decided, well, we're gonna track just about everything that, is, that has data that's connected to it. So we were looking at the cycle times of the trucks, and I'll talk about each one of these in, in a little detail. Uh, back charges and claims, it's a huge deal in the ready mix business. We needed some way to be able to protect ourselves. The revolutions of the drum. The more revolutions that you do, the, it, the drums wear down, they only take so many, you're having to replace them, that's a lot of money when you have over 1,200 trucks. GPS, we had duplications. We had uh, other companies that we were using their GPS and it was one of those where we looked at it and from a business perspective we said, why would we have a couple different GPS companies when we can kind of have an all-in-one system? And then we started finding other things, like the number of dry ups that happen in a plant. So when you're, all of a sudden you're paying attention to this data that's, and there's tons of data, and it's a matter of you figuring out what fits your business and what you're gonna actually track. Dry ups was just an enormous, and it gets swept under the rug. Nobody wants to talk about it. Well, all of a sudden we found it, and it gets talked about a lot now. Well, he talked earlier about uh, the lower admixture consumption. It, absolutely, the longer that you can delay before you put these polycarboxylates in there, the, the more effective they are, in there, and, and we've seen that. And then controlling of the water. It's, it's a huge liability again for us. It's how do you keep up with, how does a driver wash out on a job site? What does he do with it when he comes back? Is he bringing concrete? Who's putting the water in it and who's responsible for it? And one of the things that, we've, that I found out was our pump operators are really a, a big problem with having water added on a job site. And that's the one person that doesn't have a dog in the hunt at all and they're telling you to put 50 gallons of water in it. 
So one of the things that I think when anybody looks at this, you're looking at how can I reduce my cycle time on the trucks? And this gives you an idea that uh, on average for all of Verify, it was about 106 minutes. When we first got on it, and you go through a period where the equipment's on, but the lights are off, so it looks like it's off, called ghost period, and you figure out what their habits are at that time, and you, you set your benchmark. So we realized when nobody was paying attention, we were at about 99 minutes. Right now we're at 96, and some of our, our, our best location is 83, and, and that moves around. And it has a lot to do with, are my trucks stacked up? Are we having to fix slumps? Are we having to add something? So when you start looking at all this, this water addition thing is a huge deal. And it takes time. And you know, when, you, when they tell you to add water on a job site, they don't give you enough time to mix it up. So there's another liability that we had looked at and paid money out, and we said, that's what we have to focus on. And this is just one of about 10 key performance issues that we were looking at. Uh, during peak production periods, you know, if we can get the trucks to the job, have them in slump, that they, all they do is back up and dump out, it's like adding extra trucks. They're not sitting there, you're putting them in use. You saw this a minute ago, and, and I told uh, Nathan, thanks for teeing it up, because this is so real that it's unbelievable. So looking at this, somebody adds water on the job site. There's no doubt, because you, as you see, uh, it, it slides out. If you let the equipment do it, it gets there at the right slump. But what we found out was is that our customers, a lot of cases, and I'm not trying to insult any contractors that are in here, I'm just, it's what I've seen traveling all over the world. We don't always truly know what slump is. They tell us they want a five inch slump, they give, we give them a five inch slump and we find out they really want an eight. And it's, and it's for every slump that goes up. And then we found out that there was diff different applications once the truck got there, what if you were pumping it to the 30th or 40th floor? Well, that eight inch slump doesn't last very long in there and they realize that. So all of a sudden you're putting a 10 inch slump in a pump that's getting pumped up there just so they get the eight inch at the top. So we were getting smart to it that, hey, maybe we're not selling the right mix. And therefore we still have to protect ourselves and make sure that we get out to the customer and help them understand what it is that they actually need that they're putting in their building or their structure. This one absolutely shocked me. This, so this is us, it is pointing the finger at us. The revolutions of the drum. So the average within our company in the footprint in Atlanta actually, I'm sorry, Atlanta and Dallas, was somewhere between 250 revolutions to 900 on a round trip. Well then, I broke it down further and looked at the fact that just driving there on the interstate with a, could be a 10 yard load, anywhere from 30 to 200 revolutions on the way to the job. And then we also, and I didn't put it on here, we look at the speed of the revolutions where they should be at the lower end of maybe two to five. Uh-uh. So we found a safety issue. So as you go down to each one of these, because we have 1,200 plus trucks and every one of them has a different person that sits in it that looks at it different, we're now educating and going back and setting the rules on how, how do you do revolutions, what's the speed at all times, and look at, all, at every single application. So really from a safety perspective, it was really eye-opening. So earlier Nathan talked about lower admixture dosage, and you know, if you, if you look at it, you're looking for the slump, and again, it's and in millimeters. Uh, if you put it all in up front, 
This is our typical scenario, depending on if it's a polycarboxylate or maybe a, a naphthalene on how long it's going to last. But there's much lower doses. We've set it with a maximum dose. We typically never get anywhere close to it. It does it in smaller increments. The only negative thing that we found was is if the job is too close to your plant, you don't have enough time to actually get the revolutions that you need. So we have to realize when we do a job, if it's close, it goes in. It goes all in. So, and there was a big difference between the old traditional way that we loaded a truck. And I was talking to a gentleman earlier and the comment that I always ask people, ready mix people, how much do you trim your truck when you're loading it? Zero, one gallon, five gallon. And I was shocked <laughs> at the numbers that I got from a lot of people. And five was a pretty common number, which is 50 gallons of water that they're holding out of a load. And we're leaving it up to our driver to get the right slump from that standpoint. So the most technical part of our business, we were leaving in the hands of our drivers, and, and it was pretty scary. We trim zero. That's the goal. And we might give them one. Depends on, you know, some jobs like DOT jobs, they just, I guess they want to know that they've got some water. But I never understood that if you go into a lab and you develop a mix and it says it takes 32 gallons of water to get that slump and you hold water out, you never get that slump. So it, it never made sense to me. <laughs> so now what we tell them, we, and I should also add in there, the training of our batch people was absolutely critical because this is the guy that's trimming the water. So we tell them we want you to hit plus one or minus two on what the slump is supposed to be. That's that three inch range we want you to get. If they do that, and the driver just washes his truck off, now we're down looking the slump's dead on. When it manages itself, we get to the job site more in slump range than we could ever do it with 1,200 people making their own decision. So when we first looked at the system, the thought was, and the way it was said to me by my manager was, oh, you're just getting an expensive, expensive quality toy. That's what he told me. And I said, actually, what this is, is that you have to perfect production because we found all the issues that we were having in production. Once you get that part, then the quality side kicks in, and then they start listening to us. So, you know, here's what we bring it to the job site. This is what they do to it. And ultimately, we over-design because we're protecting ourselves from the people that are going to handle it once it falls off the chute. So we're finding right now the standard deviations have gone down. We're looking at changing a lot of the mixes uh, to make them with lower powder. It, it certainly helps us when it comes, you know, higher power, powder contents wreak havoc on us. So we're just trying to eliminate that side and we're obviously chasing the water. Water is the key. Our, all of our drivers have to reverse their drums as they're coming under the plant. They, we're teaching them how to wash out on the job site. You know, don't bring the water back. We, we don't want it. We don't need it. We have to do something with it. You know, we got to figure out how to use it. So. Uh, really, my take on this is that Verify just opened our eyes up on how do we stop doing what we've been doing as an industry for 90 years and do it right so that we're not sitting here having fights at the end of a job on whose fault is it. Now, the data that comes out of this makes a pretty tough argument when you can say, now, these 10 trucks sat here for over 90 minutes each and you added 50 gallons to them and... Sorry, this is your deal. Any questions?
in the back? So that last slide, and you're, you're seeing, here's the delivery in transit, here's the manipulation afterwards. If you've been able to look at, over time, as you work with those customers, that differential, you know, and showing them that information, are you able to bring that differential in so that you're, you know, adapting mixes more to what they're doing and work with them on their processes? Have you been able to actually see and mark that differential? Yes, because the biggest thing was is that they truly didn't know what slump was. So the education part and the salespeople had to get involved. They would go out and help educate them because we would pull slumps to show them that they really weren't asking for what they thought they needed. So this was just a, a summary of all the data that I think if we would go to specific customers that we had major issues with, it would be much better. Yes. Any other questions? I just wanted to say the same thing. In Belgium, we had the same basic behavior. And now the contractor, instead of ordering an S3, which is a, like a six inch hump, they are ordering S4. And then they don't have to. That's the concrete they need. And that's the concrete they order ordering. So the concrete producer now is setting the right concrete at the right price, it's a higher price concrete, but the contractor knows that it's better for them because then they don't spoil the concrete by adding water. So this, this experience happened. You educate the people with those systems because I fully agree. They don't know what slump is. They, we take a slump of four inches, like a eight, it looks like a eight inch. That's why they're ordering too low slump. That's yep. it. Kurt, thank you. Thank you. Yep.